Welcome to another edition of The Early Show with me, your host, Aidan Stone, and him, Terry Dactyl. We've got a great show for you this morning with Jackie Perkins, an image consultant. She'll be talking to us about how to express yourself. What are you your... wearing? It's my motorboard. I've been to Oxford University. What? You need to address me as Dr. Dactyl from now on. Oh, yes. I've got a BA, an MSc, and a PhD. Dr. Dactyl? That's me. While you've been messing around here with your jokes and that, I went to Oxford and I'm now a professor. A professor? A professor of what? Dr. Dactyl, professor of potology. Oh, yes. What are you talking about? I took your advice. I realised that my success or failure depends on no one but me. And I've been watching the previous shows and I've taken massive action. Well, this all sounds good. And I went on that TV quiz show and became the champion. What, what quiz show? Mastermind? Countdown? Uh, pointless? Now nah, the music one. Gilmore plays pop. Now this I've got to see. But first, please welcome my guest, Jackie Perkins. Jackie Perkins, it's great not to have you with us this morning. And it's absolutely amazing not to be there. <laughs> right. Now, um, we're going to be talking about how, how we parents watching at home and our students can express ourselves and that's what you that's what you you teased me with um so how can you do that as a job what what is it that you do well it's quite interesting because how we show ourselves to the world is through the clothes that we wear that's you know unless you're somebody who doesn't wear clothes Every single choice that you make is going to be different to me or my husband or my children or my sister or my friend because we each have an individual personality. So there's something in that personality that we want to express and tell the world. And therefore we start with, who are you as a person? Find a way to show that. And finding a way to show that through what you're wearing is understanding the language of clothes, understanding the body you've been born into. You know, if I'm five foot six or six foot or six foot six, there's nothing I can do about that. If I'm really pale skin or really dark skin or somewhere in the middle, there's not a lot subject to suntans that I can do about that. Mm. And if I've got really wild curly hair or long straight hair, there's, I can have it styled slightly differently. And yes, you can perm it and dye it and things, but actually the best and the most easiest thing is to find a hairdresser that will allow you to have your natural style and then it's no hassle. So, no so, you, so you, would you describe yourself as an image consultant? Is that what you'd say? Or do you have a, dif a different title or phrase that you use? I started as an image consultant. I'm now a coach who works around personal brand. And what I do for people is I help them gain the edge. So whether it's business or finding work or building relationships, it's about accessing the the secret power of who you are right, and getting okay, that edge. Yeah. So I've taken the image consulting mm -hmm. and and I still and I still have a foot in that camp because I belong to House of Colour. So image consultants look at how you present yourselves with your clothes and your your accessories and everything about your person. But we start mm -hmm. with that at House of Colour with who are you on the inside? What's That's your body shape? Yeah. I want to talk to you about that, but before before I ask you that, um, how did you get into it? Where, where did you, what did you do to build up oh, to that? someone become that? Has one. Yeah, especially <laughs> when I, especially when I'm looking at that beautiful scene behind you, I grew up on a farm in Cornwall, um, right. where uh, you didn't really need to wear makeup to feed the pigs or milk the cows. Uh -huh. uh, so I went to university in London and studied computing. And then I got a job and obviously computing is a corporate kind of job. And I turned up in this business and I realized that a suit was too formal, but student clothes weren't appropriate. And I had some money to buy clothes, but I didn't have enough money to do it again if I got it wrong. Right. Yeah. So I could go out and buy clothes for work. I'd allowed myself that budget, but if I got that wrong, I didn't know what I could do next. And I went along to a talk given by an image consultant and realized there was a formula and there was a system that would allow me to feel comfortable in my clothes, would allow me to feel 
like I was self-expressed, I was comfortable, people got me, but also I didn't feel that intimidation of what do they think about what I'm wearing? Do they like it? Have I got it right? Have I got it wrong? I've never particularly been into fashion and I've never particularly been into shopping. I just want to know that I look the part and then I can get on with all the other things I'm going to do. So it was that yeah. consultation where I suddenly went, oh, click. So with <clears throat> maths and computing in my background, it's about a system, a formula, a process, bingo. It's like a set of rules, but within those rules, it's not quite like the rules I have to follow. Yeah. They're the rules that give me a structure. And inside that structure, I can create my own framework. Right, let's talk about rules because at school we have uniform, the staff have a uniform of sorts. Um, you could argue that, that the male teachers do and the female teachers doesn't, but that's a different, we'll maybe come on to that later. But um, the uh, uh, students turn up in their uniform and, and at our school we have, we have not too strict, but we have an exact um, pattern of, of what the students wear and it involves a blazer and it involves a tie. Now, at the situation we're in now, we're all at home, so people are wearing what they like. They don't have to turn up to online lessons wearing anything in particular, hopefully something though. But, um, but we are welcoming some of our students back in uh, this week. And, um, and we don't know the situation for September uh, of how we'll fare with, 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 the, um, with how the, the, the virus situation goes on. Yeah. So one thing that's been put to most schools and teachers that I've spoken to and heads that I've spoken to, that uniform is being suspended. So then the, the, the children coming into schools in all ages, whether they wear a uniform or not, they're now not wearing uniform. So it sort of puts that, uh, that question, that's why I want to talk about rules, that um, with, with, the, with the uniform, we all know there's a benefit to uniform and a lot of, a lot of kids hate it um, because of those rules, because they can't express themselves. Mm -hmm. But they're suddenly going to find themselves with the rules suspended and not necessarily made clear of now what you wear. So, yeah. so can I ask you, um, how would, would you as a student or how would you advise our students to when you're suddenly, you can wear what you want, what do you do? The first question I would ask them is how do you want people to perceive you? So in English, that's what kind of student do you want people to see you as? In the same way that if you're a teacher, what kind of teacher do you want people to see you as? Mm -hmm. Or even for the parents who might be watching going to work, you know, what's your profession and how do you want to be seen? So coming back to the students, how do you want to be seen in, as a student? Do you want to be seen as uh, someone who's diligent and follow the rules and does the best all the time? Yeah. Do you want to be someone who will do the minimum to get through because they actually want more creativity? They want to show a bit more individuality. It doesn't mean the other people don't want to show individuality, but what's their priority is doing the best job they can do. So you've then got the ones who don't want to be there, who don't want to show up, who don't want to do anything, or they might rather be out on their bike or surfing or, or whatever their hobby might be riding their horse so you've got maybe those three just as starting points if you're somebody who wants to show up and do your best and you really want the teachers to know that whether you do do a great result or not a great result you've tried your best then actually you need to show that through your appearance you need to show that you've paid attention to yourself when you get dressed. So you, mm -hmm. you've washed your hair, you've dried your hair, you've, you've got a, a, an iron shirt or you tuck it in. Or, um, you know, if I just stand on my tiptoes, you know, are you wearing a belt to just finish it off? There's, there's that attention to detail that you can give people. It's the difference between brushed hair and not brushed hair. Now, some people are blessed with this kind of unruly style and they make a feature of it as you clearly have but that's fine as long as you can also show through another part of your personality and appearance that you you are serious you've got a jokey side you've got a quirky side but you turn up in that jacket every time and it's quite important for you to give that message to the children and the parents that you're here and you're consistent yeah, so if you're that person who wants to do a good job then pay attention think is this appropriate for school it's 
School for you as a student is effectively your workplace. Are you putting yourself in the right mindset? If you turn up in your tiger onesie, for example, mm. you're going to feel more like hot chocolate, popcorn, sitting on the sofa and watching a movie than sitting down and paying attention to your work. Then you've got the ones who want creativity. So they don't want to necessarily um, say stuff you to the world. Yeah, they... <laughs> more interruptions. So they don't necessarily want to, to you know, what, whatever the proverbial stick your fingers up and, and go well in me alone. But they want to show that they don't just follow the rules religiously. They've got their own take on it. For those people, it's quite interesting because if you're going to break the rules, you have to know what they are before you can push the boundaries. Right. So, you need to, so if you're going to wear a ripped T-shirt, be aware of what you're saying with that ripped T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Is the ripped T-shirt creatively torn in a specific place relating to the logo in the picture? Or is it just tatty, old and worn out? Um, you're going to give a slightly different message. If you wear something and you tuck it in or you leave it out, you're going to give a slightly different message. Are you wearing jeans or colored jeans? Because I know there's this fashion with ripped jeans, but personally, every time I see someone with ripped jeans, I wonder why they want to waste the money on them. Yeah, that's just my personal preference. So what they have to realize is they can choose the ripped jeans as their expression, but it might cost them something if they were building a relationship with someone like me, you know, in right. terms of going for an interview, in terms of getting the best out of your teacher. If they've got a teacher who really doesn't like ripped jeans, they're instinctively going to be putting themselves on a back foot by going into a conversation with that te teacher when they look like they haven't paid attention. But isn't, that, isn't there an element there of, well, that teacher shouldn't be prejudiced against ripped jeans or green hair or um or piercings or tattoos isn't isn't there an onus with the students today they would think well it's not me it's this is me i'm expressing myself and it's your fault for n not being up with it oh how long have you got this is a long <laughs> <laughs> we could be here for quite a while you're you're absolutely right on one level we we shouldn't judge people um, Black Lives Matter is, a, is an absolutely topical, relevant subject around this. Why do we judge people based on some random criteria? But the point is, I have a responsibility if I want to have a relationship with you that is productive and fruitful and um, delivers on the reason that we've connected. I have a responsibility to help that relationship build as much as you have a responsibility to help that relationship build. So one of the ways that I do it is my appearance. And I describe it a bit like Pareto Principle. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Pareto Principle is this distinction of 80-20, that you get 80% actually represents 20% of the value and then all the results, and actually 20% often delivers 80% of the results. So how I apply that is 80% of my appearance is something you see straight away. So you might describe me wearing a spotty blouse or a red dress or a pink shirt or a green something. <clears throat> but actually, when you understand something about my personality and you, and you try to describe what kind of person I am, am I, am, I the, am I the person who's wanting to pay attention? Am I the person who's wanting to show more creativity? It's the way that I put those things together that deliver those messages. So 20% of what you see is actually 80% of the message, but it's all under the surface. Mm. So it's that unconscious communication that we can't help. Our personality leaks out. You know some people are quirky and some people are serious and some people are caring and some people are funny and some people are more introvert and only have a few friends and some people are really extrovert and have a massive group of friends. All these bits of our personality leak out and they leak out also in the way that we dress. Could I so, so, okay, so I'm just gonna finish on the judgment. Yeah. So I'm not saying judge people, but we do. You know, we make a judgment on whether somebody's male or female. 
we make a judgment on their age, their experience, their affluence, where they come from. They open their mouth and they speak with an accent. We've now got a judgment, an assessment on where they're from. And we build that jigsaw puzzle to create a picture of somebody. And the problem is if that first impression is not consistent with who you are, then I'm dealing with a jigsaw puzzle in the wrong box. Mm. You know, I, I did that once. We bought a jigsaw puzzle from a charity shop. Beautiful, beautiful picture of, I can't remember what was on the picture now, but when we started making the jigsaw puzzle, it was the wrong picture. So somebody clearly tested it, assembled it, and then accidentally put them in the wrong box. Mm. So are you what you're telling me on your tin? Or are you something else? Because if you are what you're telling me, then that relationship builds at speed, it builds at trust. You don't necessarily have to like that person and want to spend a lot of time with them, but you will respect their experience. You will respect what they're bringing to the table. Whether that's teacher or student, it's the same thing. You will respect the students doing their best. The student will respect the teacher's approach. And that's all in the judgments that we make all the time. So it's also a case of, noticing a judgment and then being able to put it to one side mm -hmm. but yeah we do we do we shouldn't in theory we shouldn't judge people but we're making assessments all the time mm. on what we're dealing with and where we're going and how we're going to react next and we can't control what someone is going to think of us we can only well in very limited ways we can control it so i was going to ask you to uh, could you make one change to your appearance then what we were talking about before we started Mm. put one extra piece of clothing on and then say how we think it changes how yes. so, so the three questions i ask myself when i get dressed because i as an image consultant i know what colors what styles what shapes what patterns mm -hmm. all of those things so everything in my wardrobe suits me it's just a question of what am i going to assemble today mm -hmm. so the three questions i ask myself are what job am I going to be doing? So what's my audience? Who am I wanting to speak to and connect to? What's the weather or the climate? Am I indoors? Is it heating? Is it not heating? Am I outdoors? Am I going to need to walk across a muddy field? Mm -hmm. Am I walking through a city? Uh, do I need comfortable shoes? Or is it just a dinner party and I want to look glamorous and I haven't got to walk very far? Then I can wear my big high shoes. So what's the job and the audience? What's the climate? And then what do I want to say about myself? So it could just be a simple, what do I feel like wearing? So today I wanted something that would make an impact, but not be formal because we're in this informal, nice not to be there show. But there may be times when I need to dress it up a bit and it's very simple. I could, if I was cold, put on a cardigan, but if I needed to be more formal, I would put on a jacket. Now it doesn't have to be a really formal jacket and there's obviously levels of formality, but if you watching the show now look at me wearing this jacket, what's the difference in the message I'm giving you if I show up like this and this is my first impression? Mm -hmm. In the same way, if I do that jacket up, it gives a completely different impression. You know, much more formal. Nothing wrong, a bit plain, a bit bland, but maybe that's more appropriate to a city type environment or um, mm -hmm. it's just cold and I need to do it up against the weather. So this is where I go when I'm more formal. The challenge then is if it gets cold, mm -hmm. because sometimes the big baggy jumpy is just really what you want to curl up in. And what I've found with, um, so I've been working from home for 20 years the thing I haven't anticipated is sharing that environment with people. They're meant to be mm. at school and my husband's meant to be at work. So doors are opening, the temperature's different, the windows are open, they're closed, all things. And this year I've invested in a poncho. Now what you'll see when I put this poncho on is it's not really um, a very professional appearance. However, when I'm working from home, it's nice and warm. Mm. And actually most of the time, I'm not on the phone, I'm not on a Zoom call, I'm not talking to people. However, if I am on a Zoom call and I'm still tired uh, or cold, I could be tired, there are other ways that we can just shift how we appear. And it could be something really simple, like adding a piece of interest. So I've got a scarf here. Now, if it's a cold day and we all know it's wintry and I show up like this, just adding a scarf for me is a feature. So whether you're male or female, whether a student or a pupil, the question is, what might you add? 
And this is where ties come in. By yeah. men dropping ties, they've actually dropped a level of interest. So mm. they then actually are best advised to put the interest in somewhere else if they really don't want to wear a tie. That's why some men, I think, feel more comfortable by staying in a tie because there's something with the jacket, the shirt, the tie, there's a formality, mm. there's a system and they can follow the rules. It's an interesting yes. with the ties that, um, because it's the, we, 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 we're on certain times, it's the practicalities of these things. So surgeons don't wear ties and it's not because they'll get trapped in your giblets when they're doing an operation. It's because they're not frequently washed um, and so they do collect they do collect germs. So I think that's going to be the reason though where teachers aren't going to be, are going to be told not to wear, not to wear uh, their silk ties. So yeah. I did think, you know, my, I don't wash my silk ties very often because yeah. they need to be dry cleaned though. It's very expensive. So I was thinking, gosh, will I wear, will I wear my silk ties and my bow ties again? You know, and it, and yeah, yeah there's a, there's an element yeah. of uncertainty and sadness about that, you know. Because both and you might, and, it, and, it, and actually, I'm I'm a bit hot now, so excuse me if I now <laughs> take it off. But but as I take these clothes off, for all of you watching, what's the difference that you see? You know, I've gone from being being warm, and then I then I take it back. But the the story you just reminded me of is so. There's my more formal look. And actually, if you don't mind, it's quite warm in this office today. I'll go back to my shirt. Um, the story you reminded me of was, this, was a client I had whose his, his mum was actually a client of mine. And she recognised that at the age of 17, he'd just gone through a growth spurt and he probably wouldn't grow again. So any suit that she bought him at the age of 17, 18 was probably still going to have to be working for him when he came out of university looking for a job. Now, I don't know about you or how many parents here were um, at university in the, uh, uh, when was it, early 90s I graduated. And a lot of my male peers in that world had gone into university with suits they bought at the end of the 80s. So there were little sparkly flecks in them. And of course, four years later, they're going into job interviews with little sparkly flecks in their suit, which is not appropriate. It's a fashion statement but they've got no choice because they've got no mm. other suit. So it's about how do you invest in something? Something like a suit, as long as you are the same weight and the same height, the suit will still be working for you in 10 years, 20 years time. So buy something that's a classic. And this student had come on that basis. His mum had recognized that she understood what suited him. He could buy this, the, the core things, and they would still be working for him. But what was fascinating is when I took him through the language of clothes and explained what a collar means, what a tie means, what a jacket means, what a belt means, how might he put the details in as a man versus a woman. He took all of that information and he went to school. He was in the sixth form, so there was no uniform, but there was a dress code. And one of the things was they had to wear a tie. So he changed from a regular tie to a bow tie. And then he, although he wore a belt, he didn't tuck his shirt in. Mm. I'm not recommending to you students that you do that, but what he'd done is he'd taken the rules, he'd recognized what the rules were, and then he'd made his own interpretation of them. So he was still within the boundaries. So he was saying, I'm here, I'm turning up, I'm doing what you want, but I'm doing it in my way. Rather than turning up in an outfit that says, I don't want to be here, I don't want to take part, I can't wait till I leave, kind mm. of thing. And of course, just for the record, um, shirts must be tucked in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, page 49 of the handbook or something like that. Um, so, so for those students who want to make a difference, then wear a belt. You know, it, putting a belt on makes a slightly different statement, but make it a subtle belt or an in-your-face or whatever, but it, it should ideally tone with the trousers or the skirt you're wearing but there might be something that you can do with the buckle is it gold is it silver it's really simple there's a difference you'll never see me wearing any gold metal because it doesn't suit me so my watch and my rings are all based on the silver metal whereas other people their skin tone requires gold we instinctively know what works for us but that's how we just put those little quirky bits in the, yeah, the rules that we've got, and I say they're going to be not suspended, but they're mo heavily modified in the ways we, do, we don't know. Um, and people will be looking to express themselves in different ways, or the opposite of that in a way, that to not be noticed, to not wanting to stand out. 
and and some 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 of our people would fall in fall into that category and interpreting those rules is going to be one that one of the things that uh, will be interesting to see we've we have had students turn up in 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 green hair and um and, and you know who you are <laughs> and, and, it, and, and she was right in saying it didn't say in the rules you can't have green hair. I don't know whether it's been added or not since, but, but, but it was an interesting debate that it didn't say that. Um, but what it did say is dress appropriately, you know, present yourself appropriately. So uh, that's what I was hoping that that's what our talk this morning has, has been able to do is to recognise what appropriateness is for yourself and for the environment you're in. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So it's just, about taking responsibility. So as, a, as an individual, I'm responsible for the relationships that I attract into my life, whether they're work or personal. And the way that I take responsibility for that is to make it easier for people to build a relationship with me. So that they don't have to like me, but if they know who I am, then they know how to relate to me. And so I show people. But take the green hair, for example. There's a message she's saying. You know, she might have pushed her comfort zone way off the scale to try something really different, but there's something she's saying with the green. And the trick is to get under the surface. It's like whether people, whether the met boys have beards or not. It's about whether people choose later in life to have tattoos or piercings or there's something we're saying. If we can get under the surface and understand what we're trying to say with those things, then actually there may be another way of saying it that won't get someone else's back up. Mm. There may be another way of saying it that won't break the rule that hasn't been written yet. You know, those kind of things. And of course it tests the school because the school now has to think, how do we write it? But we can't be sexist. We can't be ageist. We can't be colored. We can't be raised. All these things that we can't be, how do we frame them? Mm. How do we put them in a way that people understand? Um, and I know that at my son's school, the rule around hair dyeing is it has to be of a natural shade. So I could go to blonde or I could go to black, but I can't go to pink or green or blue because that's not a natural color of hair. Mm. So that's, that's a challenge for the school, for those of you watching. And, but it's like hair, you know, um, long hair. Do you tell girls to do their hair one way and boys to do it another way? Actually, for me, it's really simple. You, you either let them do what they want or you have a rule that says, if it's touching the collar, you tie it up, or something that's straightforward and it applies equally to boys as, girl, as does to girls. You know, if you want to wear a skirt, um, you know, for most of us who've seen the boy in a dress, if you want to wear a skirt, that's fine, but it's gotta be a certain length, it's gotta be a certain style, it's gotta be a certain, you know, whatever the criteria you want to put around it, it doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl, but if you're going to wear a skirt, it needs to be of these criteria and if you're going to wear trousers you know are they skinny are they short are they long are they flares does it matter but the school need to question does it matter because obviously if you're going into a science lab or somewhere where there's a safety hazard it might matter but the school have to make that decision and then look at how do they frame it in a way and it may be that the children can get involved in this because they know what they want to be able to do, but it also gets them to take responsibility for what the school is having to consider. It helps them understand what's going on for the other party. Mm. I, think that's really, I think that leads into a, a really interesting, what you could do for our task for our tutor groups. And um, I know we had various different ideas, but I think it should be what you've just said there, that, that in our tutor groups today, we should, dis we should have a discussion about, about the rules, what they should be, what they could be, um, what's the appropriateness of, of clothing and hair and all the things we've discussed. I think that'd be, that would be quite an interesting discussion to have with our tutor groups. Yeah. And, and, and it starts with what's the purpose and then what do you want to say? What, yeah. How do you want to be seen? So that we are, you, prepared. <laughs> are prepared. So we are prepared if, if, if the case is that uniform is modified or suspended for a longer period of time, then, then we're prepared that we know what the issues are. That would be a, re that, that would be a good use good use of our time yeah so it's having that it's having that supportive framework and and for younger children who may not be able to engage in that it could be um the other example that we discussed was what parts do people play in a, in a play and how do you dress it because there are certain rules the queen has to look a certain way the 
the wicked witch has to look a certain way the baddie has to look a certain way the mm. you know if you're dressing peter pan there's not a lot of options that you can give him for his outfit so there are rules that we address how would you do that and then if you if you sow that those seeds with the younger children then they start to realize how that applies to life because we each play a part in life and we want that part to be as true to who we are as possible because telling the truth doesn't need to be remembered so, yeah. when we start. so if you wanted to if you wanted to say we could say if, if we're picturing a villain how would we how would we dress that villain what would she wear you know and um and if you were <laughs> yeah, if you were to if you were to have a of a hero, um, what type of Edwardian velvet frock cloak, uh, coat would he wear? You know, absolutely, <laughs> yes. And what, but but even down to the fact that you've deliberately chosen the school logo to be on your jacket, it says something. Other people choose a club pin. Other people choose um, yeah. something rebellious. Yes, very good, and, and it's beautiful. I love it. I love it, but it says something. Um, and then um, for those of you who remember Madeleine Albright, the um, American politician, there's a whole book on her brooches. Her brooches had meaning. Mm. And there's a whole conversation on how the queen chooses her brooches mm -hmm. and what she's saying with them and where have they come from. And the language of clothes is absolutely fascinating. And it actually goes back to those times when uh, there was a lord of the sumptuaries, so we call it sumptuary law, and the lord of the sumptuaries made sure that your rank and file was correct. So if you had a bustle, it had to be, you know, ladies of a certain status could wear a big bustle, but other ladies had to wear a smaller one, and men could wear, the, the winkle pickers could be so long, depending on their rank, depending on their file, depending on their status in society. Um, and this is where all these rules come from. They then get translated into military dress, and then from military dress, we interpret them into civilian dress. Mm. And that's the problem. If you don't understand where they come from, it can be a bit of a minefield. And, that, and I think that's probably why the women struggle more than the men sometimes, because with men, you've got a lot fewer options. You know, you've got a shirt, you've got a jacket, you've got a jumper, you've got trousers. You yeah. don't usually yeah. wear shorts to work, but some might do. Whereas for women, we can do almost anything if it suits us. You know, we can do the red suit. We can do patterns, we can do frills, ruffles, lace. How do we do it appropriately if that's our expression? Mm. Yeah, so it's, as I say, I love it because it's actually got nothing to do with what you wear. It's got everything to do with who you are and being able to know who you are and express it. That's brilliant. I wish we could talk about this for, 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 for a lot longer, but we'll have to leave it there. But, um, but Jackie, thanks, thanks for talking to us this morning. And uh, and I hope you get a chance to to get out there and uh, help more people express themselves. And uh, we'll let you know how we get on with with how we how we cope with these changes. But um, thanks for telling us all about this fascinating subject that a lot of us, including me, you, know, you know, hardly know you hardly know the history of these things and why we do stuff. And it's good to know. That's the point of a, the point of this. But thanks again, and uh, all the best with what you do. Very welcome. Thank you very much. To the final with some hard-hitting questions for our final contestant, Terry Dactyl. Terry, I'm going to give you a pop question from each of the last eight decades. You need to give me the song title and the artist who performed it. Are you ready? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Question one. This song from 1954 was the first in the UK to sell more than one million copies. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. Bit lady in the comments. Correct. 
Question two. This was the first song ever played on Radio One when it launched in 1967. I'm just sitting watching flowers in the rain, feel the power of the rain, making the garden grow. The move. Correct. Question three. This American singer-songwriter wrote this 1976 hit to celebrate the birth of his daughter, Aisha. What was it? Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Stevie Wonder. Correct. Question four. This duo were very big in the 1980s and the female singer, who was born on Christmas Day, went on to become a very successful solo artist. This was one of their biggest hits about sugary fantasies in 1983. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? I travel the world and the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. Eurythmics. Correct. Question five. This 90s band had a very distinct sound, but when they split up, one went off to make cheese and another formed the Gorillas. The distinctive 1994 song is noted for containing elements of spoken word in the verses and won British Single of the Year. All the people so many people, they all can hand in hand, hand in hand through their part life. Blur. Correct. Question six. This song from 2009 was the first one to sell more than one million downloads in the UK. I've got a feeling that tonight's going to be a good night. Oh, I can't do it. Tonight's going to be a good night. No. I'm going to have to rush you. Tonight's going to be a good night. i got a feeling that tonight's going to be a good night. Tonight's going to be a good night. Black Eyed Peas. Correct. Well done, Terry. Question seven. This song reached number one in a record-breaking 36 countries upon its release. This person has famously sung one of the Bond themes, but can you name this song? Hello, it's me. I was wondering if after all these years you'd like to meet Adele. Correct. Question eight. What was the first number one of the 2020s? I wish I had a river I could skate away on. Ellie Goulding. Correct. You scored eight out of eight, which makes you pop champion. Well done, Ted. Yeah. 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 Dedication, dedication, 
Dedication, that's what you need If you want to be the best If you want to beat the rest mm -hmm. Dedication's what you need If you want to be a record breaker Yeah